When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind – the Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three-quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means little ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone, the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week. And it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. 
nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. Enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. Wow! Earth's surface is shaking! Long cracks split the ground open. Lava rivers are rapidly flowing down the slopes. Deafening noise is filling the air. Rocks and other debris are flying high up. Clouds of volcanic gas and ash cover the sky. Now this is not a plot of a blockbuster disaster movie. It's what happens when super volcanoes decide to erupt. But this is likely not the scenario that will take place when the world's largest volcano, Mauna Loa, decides to finish its long, long nap. In 2021, scientists were sure it would happen soon. But so far, nothing. The volcano's seismicity keeps increasing and then going back to normal. But you never know when this giant will finally come back to life. That's why experts have been monitoring geological activity on Hawaii's largest island for quite some time. The Big Island of Hawaii is made up of five volcanoes, including the most active on the planet, Kilauea, and the largest, Mauna Loa. This gigantic thing makes up almost half the landmass of the island. 
And what lava Kilauea emits in one day, Mauna Loa could spew out within 20 minutes. That's what it did in 1984. While Mauna Loa's smaller sibling has been throwing tantrums for a while, the giant has been slumbering ever since its last eruption. But very recently, the Hawaii Volcano Observatory has recorded more than 200 mini-earthquakes below Mauna Loa. It likely means an increased flow of magma down there. Good morning! The volcano might be waking up. Or not. If Mauna Loa did suddenly erupt, lava flows could reach the ocean and the most populated and touristy places, like Captain Cook, very, very quickly, in a matter of hours. In 1984, the last time the volcano erupted, lava got as far as the outskirts of Hilo on the other side of the island. That's where a campus of the University of Hawaii is found. Luckily, people had a few weeks' warning to get ready for the disaster. These days, locals have special go-bags ready with the most important stuff, including documents and money. Such precautions can come in handy in case of an emergency evacuation. Even though most Mauna Loa eruptions have so far only affected the summit area, several of them sent lava all the way down to the ocean. And you never know how powerful the next eruption will be. Now, what is the highest mountain on Earth? Mount Everest, you say? Well, it depends. From seafloor to the summit, Mauna Loa is a thousand feet taller than the famous Himalayan peak. The volcano is so big, it makes the Pacific plate it's sitting on literally slump under its weight. Scientists say that when this monster of a volcano erupts, the volume of lava coming out per unit will be life-threatening. Over its recorded history, Mauna Loa has been erupting regularly, almost every six years. And even though the last eruption of the volcano occurred about 40 years ago, scientists are certain it'll happen again. Now, remember the scene I showed you at the beginning? Well, you can relax. It's not likely to happen with Mauna Loa. The thing is, big island volcanoes, including Mauna Loa, aren't very volatile. That's because they're shield volcanoes. These volcanoes got such a name because they aren't really very high and resemble a warrior's shield placed flat on the ground. Shield volcanoes get formed by very fluid lava. It travels farther and forms much thinner flows than lava erupted from a stratovolcano, which is conically shaped and tall, like the infamous Krakatoa in Indonesia. So if, or should I say when, Mauna Loa erupts, there probably won't be ash clouds and tons of debris. The most dangerous thing will be lava. Since Mauna Loa is a shield volcano, its lava is extremely fluid and voluminous, which allows it to flow far and fast. Using theoretical vent maps, experts from the Hawaii Volcano Observatory have made charts of possible lava flows. They're kind of worried about earthquakes clustering at high rates. It likely means that lava is on the move under the surface. 500 to 600 earthquakes per day are a serious reason to be on high alert. On the other hand, it doesn't necessarily mean a disaster or inevitable eruption. Around a decade ago, several earthquakes that happened at the same time signaled that something was happening under Mauna Loa. But an eruption didn't occur. Instead, half the volcano shifted a bit to the south. This way, it probably gave more room to magma so that it had enough space to stay beneath the surface. Now, let's get back to the catastrophic eruption we saw at the beginning of the video. That's what often happens when a supervolcano erupts. Those are volcanoes that have at least once had an eruption with a volcanic explosivity index of 8, which is the largest recorded number on the index. Supervolcanoes are often extremely large, with no cone at all. That's because they're typically the remains of gigantic magma chambers that once flared up, leaving behind a caldera. They're usually found over hot spots. Supervolcanoes can produce super eruptions, and when they do, they blow more than 240 cubic miles of ash, molten rock, and hot gases up into the air. In other words, four super eruptions could fill the Grand Canyon to the brim. Supervolcanoes get formed when gigantic volumes of scorching hot magma are trying to escape from deep underground. This magma rises close to the surface but can't break through Earth's crust. That's why a huge pressurized pool of bubbling magma gathers at a depth of only several miles. The pressure keeps growing because more magma is trying to get to the surface until, bam, a super eruption occurs. 
the most recent super eruption happened in New Zealand. Well, when I say recent, I mean around 26,500 years ago. Nah, I wasn't around then. That's when a supervolcano beneath the surface of Lake Taubo spewed into the air more than 300 cubic miles of ash and pumice. Imagine 500,000 great pyramids of Giza flying up at the same time. That's how incredibly powerful that eruption was. But the most exciting and confusing thing about the eruption was that the Taubo volcano simply didn't go off like many others. At first, everything was going as usual. More than 200 square miles of magma had built up under the surface, and the pressure was getting higher and higher. But after the rock cracked and the first part of lava rushed out of the crater, something went wrong, and the supervolcano took a break. Only several months later, the disastrous eruption shook the ground, and thousands of tons of lava, rocks, and ash flew high into the atmosphere. But the age of supervolcanoes isn't over. The most infamous of them all is probably the one in Yellowstone National Park. This giant handles at least three mega-powerful eruptions, and who knows how many smaller ones. If this monster erupted anywhere as strongly as it did 2.1 million years ago, it would spit out more than 588 cubic miles of red-hot material. You can probably picture it more vividly if I tell you that this volume is comparable to 65 million capital rotundas in Washington, D.C. piled together. Wow. Anyway, scientists are sure that Yellowstone doesn't present any danger these days. For an eruption to happen, magma inside must be at least 50% molten. With the Yellowstone caldera, this number is just 5 to 15%. But of course, Yellowstone isn't the only supervolcano on our planet. There's also New Zealand's Tabo you already know about, Japan's Eri Cauldra, California's Long Valley, Indonesia's Toba, any of them can one day produce a super eruption. There are also several so called supervolcanoes that haven't lived up to this name yet because they've never produced anything like a super eruption. For example, in 1883, Indonesian volcano Krakatoa went off. The power of the eruption tore the volcano's walls open, and cold seawater rushed into its molten insides. The difference in temperature made the volcano blow up with a deafening boom. It was clearly heard 2,000 miles away in Australia. It earned the blast the title of the loudest sound in history. But even though the consequences of this event were truly catastrophic, it still turned out not powerful enough to be called a super eruption. The latest super eruption of Yellowstone occurred 640,000 years ago, and it was long before Homo sapiens saw the light of day. But we were around during another, no less devastating natural disaster. This super eruption took place on the island of Sumatra around 74,000 years ago. That's when an erupting supervolcano wreaked havoc on huge territories sending up plumes of debris and ash that spread for thousands of miles and caused temperatures on the planet to plummet. The effects of this super eruption were visible as far away as southern Africa. Experts believe they could have impacted early humans there. By the time the volcano erupted, our ancestors had already been using stone tools and had likely known how to produce yarn. And some specialists even think that the Toba super eruption was so powerful it could push our ancestors to the brink of extinction. They claim that Toba might be the largest volcanic eruption to occur on Earth within the last 2 million years. The eruption disgorged so much pyroclastic rock it would be enough to cover the entire United States to the depth of a one-story house. About a third of that deposit piled up on northern Sumatra while a lot more ended up beneath the floor of the Indian Ocean. The super eruption left an elliptical crater lake around 60 miles long. The caldera is so large it's hard to feel that you're indeed in a volcano. Pumice deposits from the eruption remain in the canyon walls and go deep below the ground. There aren't many arguments about the amount of pumice and ash involved in this disaster. At the same time, experts aren't sure how much sulfur ended up in the atmosphere. Even some sulfur layers in the polar ice could be potential candidates. But so far, scientists haven't found any connection between them and Toba.
But let's get back to the dramatic impact the super eruption had on early humans. It turns out some not only survived, but even thrived after this natural catastrophe, at least judging by the artifacts they made during and after the eruption. The disaster might not have posed a serious threat to those of our ancestors who took refuge along the coast. Genetic evidence hints that modern humans descend from a few thousand people that ventured out of Africa around 60,000 years ago. Why just a few thousand? According to some experts, the rest of our ancestors could have been devastated by the Toba eruption. After all, the supervolcano spewed out a thousand cubic miles of dust and rock in a flash, leaving a scar in the ground that was dozens of miles wide. All that dust and sulfur Toba sent into the atmosphere potentially cooled the surface of our planet, which led to the appearance of glaciers and the lowering of Earth's sea levels. And since Toba might have had an important role in shaping humankind, scientists have been working hard trying to understand precisely how early humans reacted to this disaster. In 2011, several researchers found an enigmatic soil sample in South Africa's Pinnacle Point, an archaeological site overlooking the Indian Ocean. This sample contained some volcanic ash. After examining the layer, they found more than 400,000 artifacts left by early humans. Those ranged from heat-treated stone tools to signs of fire and animal bones. Based on this finding, the team suggested that early humans on the South African coast thrived after the eruption, living in that area for thousands of years and improving their tools. The region might have served as a refuge during and after the Toba eruption, a 2009 study suggested that the eruption could have lowered global temperatures by 14 degrees Fahrenheit. It would have made survival tough elsewhere in Africa. If there had been a volcanic winter, it wouldn't have been as cold along the coastline. On the other hand, newer studies claim that Toba spewed out so much sulfur into the atmosphere that the resulting aerosols could have stuck together, which would have limited their cooling effect in the long term. In other words, right after the eruption, temperatures would have plummeted, but only in some regions. And after three years or so, the effects of the eruptions would have calmed down altogether, becoming not dangerous to humans. Well, apparently, more research is needed. Meanwhile, let's figure out if we should watch out for any volcanoes these days. Last year, thousands of small earthquakes shook the ground near Iceland's Svartsengi geothermal power plant. Magma rose to the surface there, and now it has opened wide fractures slicing through the small town of Grindavik. The ground there is still swelling, and an eruption might happen with little notice. But of course, that's not all. Over the planet, 45 other volcanoes keep rumbling. For example, Italy's Vesuvius, that infamous thing that finished the city of Pompeii in 79 CE. Over the last 17,000 years, the volcano has experienced eight explosive eruptions, followed by powerful pyroclastic flows. Dense masses of super-hot ash, lava fragments, and gases flowing at high speeds. The volcano's last eruption happened in 1944. Mount Rainier is one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the USA. Its high elevation, chemical composition, and proximity to Washington, Seattle, and Tacoma suburbs and the volcano's ability to produce massive pyroclastic flows make Mount Rainier a threat to consider. The heat from this volcano could potentially melt the ice and snow covering it, leading to rapid downstream flows of debris, mud, and rocks. The Novarupta volcano in Alaska's Katmai National Park and Reserve formed in a 1912 eruption, which was the world's largest in the 20th century. The volcano sent almost 7 cubic miles of ash and debris into the air. It also produced such a powerful ash flow that it created the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Mount Pinatubo is located in a populated region in the Philippines. It became notorious after a 1991 massive eruption, which was the second largest eruption of the 20th century. More than 700 people lost their lives during that natural disaster. Today, more than 21 million people live within 62 miles of Pinatubo. Mount Agun, 
a continuously erupting volcano in Indonesia, had its last major eruption in 1963. It was one of the most tragic eruptions in the country's history. It lasted for 11 months, producing ashfall and pyroclastic flows that led to the loss of more than 1,000 lives and serious property damage. People saw ash plumes above the volcano throughout 2018, following the eruption in November 2017. Japan's Mount Fuji hasn't erupted since 1707. That year, a massive earthquake likely set it off. In 2014, experts warned that Fuji could be at risk of another eruption following the nine-magnitude earthquake that shook Japan in 2011. Experts believed the earthquake had raised pressure below Fuji. The eruption in 1707 sent so much ash and debris into the air that all this mass even reached Tokyo. Should Fuji erupt again, it would affect more than 25 million people in the surrounding areas. The eruption of Washington's Mount St. Helen in 1980 was one of the most destructive volcanic events in U.S. history. 57 people, as well as thousands of animals, lost their lives during that natural disaster. The eruption also destroyed around 200 square miles of forest. Experts think that Mount St. Helens' history of massive eruptions means that future catastrophes are bound to happen. The next explosive eruption might send large amounts of ash all over the Pacific Northwest. No wonder the volcano is under close monitoring. One of Indonesia's most active volcanoes, Mount Merapi, has been erupting for centuries. NASA claims that the biggest risk of this volcano is pyroclastic flows which can spread over vast areas and harm loads of people. For the last time, Merapi erupted in January 2024, sending plumes of smoke into the air. These days, more than 24 million people live in the area surrounding this volcano. If all the volcanoes on Earth suddenly erupted together, it'd be loud. <laughs> We'd also have around 1,500 of these formations bursting at once. Now, normally it's just 10 to 20 volcanoes that are active each day. But what would the world look like if they all blew their tops simultaneously? Geologists think it wouldn't be pretty. Even if only the land volcanoes erupted together, it would set off a chain reaction way worse than anything we've ever seen before. The two big problems would be ash and volcanic gases. While the explosions in lava would be damaging for people nearby, the real danger lies in what happens next. A thick layer of ash would cover the planet, blocking out sunlight completely. No sunlight means no photosynthesis, which means crops would fade away and temperatures would drop considerably. And all this ash cloud could remain in our atmosphere for up to 10 years. Now, ash aside, there's also acid rain to worry about. Volcanic gases like hydrochloric acid and sulfur dioxide would mix with the atmosphere and fall back down as acid rain. This type of weather would harm the groundwater and ocean surfaces. Even if humans would find a way to survive up to this point, we'd have no corals and no other sea creatures around. Scientists have seen similar events in Earth's history at a smaller scale. Big volcanic eruptions have been linked to mass extinctions, when Mount Pinatubo erupted in 1991, it cooled parts of the world for two years. But the extra carbon dioxide from these eruptions could also heat the planet, the same way we turn our stoves to broil for that extra crispy layer on our casserole. Mm. Geologists also mentioned that there's evidence in our atmosphere that stuff like this may have happened in the distant past. During the Cretaceous period, Carbon dioxide levels were way higher than today, which made it difficult for marine life to thrive. Who would survive all this? Probably just some extremophiles, these organisms that survive in harsh conditions like hot springs or deep undersea vents. As for humans, we could all lay low in underground bunkers until things clear up, or build multiple space stations that could fit us all. Yeah, right. The chances of all volcanoes erupting at once, though, are very slim. Whew. That's because there isn't one giant source supplying all the volcanoes on Earth. Each one of these openings has its own deposit of magma, except for a few cases where they indeed share the supply. 
For example, in 1912, Nova Rupta in Alaska erupted alongside another volcano sharing magma. Scientists have also found evidence of magma hiding under volcanic areas, like under the Taupau Volcanic Zone in New Zealand. This magma can spread out horizontally for long distances, but is still just a local feature. Even if we consider all the magma under Taupau as one system, it's not connected to other volcanic areas like Indonesia or the Philippines. Because the great majority are isolated, volcanoes can't sink up to erupt at once. The magma comes from different processes, like mantle decompression or adding water to the mantle through subduction. There's no way to make all these different volcanoes erupt together because of how tectonics work. Now, that doesn't mean we won't see interesting volcano activity in the future. Take an underwater area near British Columbia, where recently about 200 small earthquakes per hour have been noted. Deep beneath the Pacific Ocean floor, off the coast of Vancouver Island, magma is set to erupt, heating the water so much that it'll bubble like soda. However, this event will likely go unnoticed by anyone other than scientists. The anticipated eruption will most likely happen around 3 miles below the ocean surface. Scientists explain that the earthquakes range from negative to 4.1 magnitude, meaning only those nearby would feel any tremors. This unusual activity gives us a rare opportunity to study how the Earth's crust forms. The magma beneath the ocean floor is estimated to be almost 1,500 degrees Fahrenheit, but will cool rapidly upon eruption and contact with water. This runny rock will solidify upon contact with the seafloor, turning black quickly. This event will be useful for biologists, too, who will have the opportunity to study the marine animal's response to any changes, like run! Antarctica, often seen as a vast icy continent, also holds a volcanic surprise beneath its frozen surface. Researchers have identified over 130 under the western ice sheet alone making it the largest volcanic region on Earth. Most of these volcanoes, about 90, were only recently discovered in 2017. But could any of these Antarctic volcanoes actually erupt? Well, it depends on which volcano we're talking about. While these formations are relatively young in geologic terms, it's hard for scientists to tell if they're still active or not. There are only two confirmed active volcanoes in Antarctica, Deception Island and Mount Erebus. The latter, standing tall as the highest peak on the continent, has been continuously erupting since at least 1972. It's known for emitting gas and steam, and sometimes even throwing out rocks in what are called Strombolian eruptions. One of its most notable features is a persistent lava lake in its crater, a rare phenomenon due to specific conditions needed to keep the surface molten. For instance, it's fueled by a steady supply of magma from deep within the Earth's mantle. This continuous inflow of molten rock provides the material for the lava lake to exist. It also features low ambient temperatures. Despite its location in Antarctica, Erebus has relatively mild temperatures in its summit region because of the heat generated by the volcanic activity. This allows the lava lake to remain liquid rather than freezing over. Deception Island, another active volcano, last erupted in the 70s. While it's currently not showing signs of imminent eruption, it's being monitored closely for any concerning activity. Apart from these two being confirmed to be active, Antarctica is dotted with fumaroles, openings in the Earth's crust that release gases and vapors. Sometimes these fumaroles can create icy towers reaching heights of 10 feet. What we should focus on is maybe supervolcanoes. They're this type that has the potential to produce the most massive and destructive eruptions. Unlike the typical one, which has a single vent, supervolcanoes have a vast magma chamber beneath the surface, spanning tens or even hundreds of miles in diameter. Their eruptions can have catastrophic effects on the surrounding area and even impact global climate patterns because of the amounts of ash and gases they spill out into the atmosphere. One famous supervolcano is the Yellowstone one which some say is gearing up for another eruption. It has the capacity to unleash a colossal eruption, spewing over 240 cubic miles of material. As much as we'd like to predict its behavior, volcanoes don't stick to a calendar. Hmm. On the contrary, 
Eruptions simply happen when there's enough magma beneath the surface. There also needs to be enough pressure for the magma to travel upwards. As far as we can measure, these conditions are not currently met at Yellowstone. Sure, many volcanoes operate on a cyclical pattern, but that doesn't mean Yellowstone is overdue. In fact, Yellowstone has had just three major eruptions over the past 2.1 million years. Also, the term supervolcano refers to the formation size, not necessarily how fussy it is. Yellowstone's monitoring is extensive, tracking seismicity, ground deformation, thermal emissions, gas, water chemistry, and surface changes. Signs of an eruption would include thousands of earthquakes over a short period. We'd also see deformation on the ground and weird gas emissions ahead of time. Stable as it might look like for now, the consequences of it having a major eruption could look ugly. Ash dispersion could blanket a 500-mile radius, potentially disrupting Midwest agriculture and clogging waterways. Ash and gas emissions into the stratosphere could induce global climactic effects, making our planet colder for several years. And yes, we've seen some research that it shows there's more liquid molten rock under the Yellowstone volcano than scientists believe. But that doesn't translate to imminent danger. So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, the eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the volcanic explosivity index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual, but it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew there should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster. Park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, That's not how volcanoes work. 
Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows, and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ashfall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It had been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. 
That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing supereruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. So this huge volcano, everyone thought to be extinct, woke up and spat out a black ash cloud 50 miles high. That's about nine times as tall as Mount Everest. Located in what is now Indonesia, the powerful Krakatoa had caused huge tsunamis that rocked over ships as far away as South Africa. It also changed the temperatures around the world for several years. The volcanic island of Krakatoa in the Sunda Strait was likely born thanks to another major eruption several centuries ago. It hadn't erupted for at least 200 years before 1883. So the first tremors and blasts in May of that year came as a total shock to people living nearby. Then ships sailing through the busy water passage started reporting clouds of ash above the volcano. It went quiet again for a while, but they could still see ash above it. The eruption culminated at the end of August. It was so powerful that it shattered the island into fragments. Witnesses heard the sound produced by it in Australia, around 3,000 miles away. They described the noise as the roar of heavy cannons. Some say it was the loudest sound ever heard. During the next five days, the pressure wave from the eruption traveled around the globe three and a half times and was seen on barographs on different continents. Hot avalanches of ash spread down the volcano as far as 25 miles away at crazy speeds. They ruined the surrounding islands and took 36,000 lives. Tens of thousands more drowned in tsunamis that happened after the volcano had collapsed into the caldera. Over 100 coastal villages on Java and Sumatra were completely wiped out. All this made the waking up of Krakatoa one of the most devastating in the entire recorded history. The Earth's crust is like a giant puzzle made up of massive pieces known as tectonic plates. These plates are constantly sliding against each other over the mantle, which is the molten layer beneath. Indonesia is right in the middle of the so-called subduction zone. Here, the Indo-Australian plate collides with part of the Asian plate as it moves northward. As the oceanic plate dives down, it gets heated up, and you've got the perfect recipe for a volcanic hotspot. Krakatoa had three peaks, each serving as an exit door for a massive magma chamber beneath it. During a previous eruption, debris blocked one of these exits, and the pressure built up beneath. When Krakatoa finally blew its top, the blast split the magma chamber wide open. The eruption led to a so-called volcanic winter. Krakatoa had sent six cubic miles of rock, ash, and debris into the atmosphere. They created a thick veil that surrounded the Earth. The particles scattered sunlight, and the troposphere below cooled down. The effect stayed strong for several years. The northern hemisphere experienced colder-than-average temperatures, and in some regions, summer temperatures didn't rise to typical levels. Southern California received a record amount of rainfall in the months following the eruption. The sky became darker in different parts of the world for years afterwards. The sunsets, for many months, turned into a spectacular show of red and orange. One astronomer supposed it was the source of the inspiration for The Scream by Edvard Munch. The painting shows exactly what the sky over Norway looked like after the eruption. It also produced a rare type of halo called Bishop's Ring and a volcanic purple light at night. 
For several years after Krakatoa had blown up, the moon looked blue and sometimes green. That's because some ash clouds were full of particles large enough to scatter red light, only letting other colors pass. Someone even witnessed lavender sun and night-shining clouds. Krakatoa became the first scientifically well-recorded and studied eruption of a volcano. Between the moments the first clouds of ash were seen by a ship passing by and the disastrous eruption, scientists managed to organize geological expeditions. They studied the volcano and gathered samples of volcanic rocks. It became useful for understanding volcanic activity. Krakatoa was sleeping tight until the 1920s, when some locals noticed a column of steam and debris spewing from the collapsed caldera. Within weeks, the rim of a new cone sprang up above sea level. After a year, it was a small island named Child of Krakatoa. It continues to erupt, but fortunately, without serious consequences so far. In April of 1815, Mount Tambora unleashed a massive eruption, wreaking havoc on the Indonesian island of Sambawa. It destroyed homes and claimed 10,000 lives. Another 80,000 perished because of diseases that spread in the aftermath. The following went in history as the year without a summer. Cold, wet conditions wrapped Europe and North America in an unexpected chill. It became the coldest in at least 250 years. In the summer of that year, the temperatures dropped the most. Crops didn't grow, livestock didn't survive, and famine took over Western Europe and North America. New England had snow and terrible frost in the summer months. Food prices went up. Oats for horses became a luxury. Some people say it even inspired the invention of the bicycle in 1817. Scientists used early data and climate models to see if it was all because of the Tambora eruption. They compared the data to similar years. They showed that precipitation was around the same, but the temperatures were much warmer. When they introduced the volcano into the scenario, they got the exact data for the year without summer. They say that a powerful volcanic eruption like that one increases the likelihood of extreme cold by up to 100 times. The explosion of the Toba supervolcano on the island of Sumatra around 74,000 years ago became the Earth's largest volcanic eruption in 28 million years. Parts of Indonesia, India, and a slice of the Indian Ocean got a cozy blanket made up of 6 inches of volcanic debris. It spat out a volume of rock comparable to almost 3 million Empire State Buildings. The crater it had left behind is still seen from space. All the ash and volcanic gases that sprang into the atmosphere because of the eruption partially blocked the sunlight. A severe volcanic winter began and lasted for 6 to 10 years. Some anthropologists see a connection between the Toba eruption and how limited modern humans are when it comes to genetic variety. Around 74,000 years ago, exactly when the Toba erupted, there was a population nosedive. That's why all modern humans trace their roots back to a tiny group of survivors. The Toba catastrophe theory proposes that most early humans in Europe and Asia didn't make it through the post-eruption climate chaos. Instead, a lucky, genetically limited bunch found their safe haven in Africa. But archaeological and paleoclimate records disagree with this theory. Benjamin Black from Rutgers University and his team set out to crack the code and discovered a hidden paradox. Maybe we were peering through the wrong climate lens. They ran 42 different climate model simulations, varying the magnitude of volcanic emissions, time of year of the eruption, background climate state, and eruption column height to see what climate disruptions the Toba eruption might have caused. There was a significant drop in temperatures in the Northern Hemisphere in the first year after the event, up to 18 degrees Fahrenheit. The Southern Hemisphere, where the early humans were settling, didn't go through a rough cooling that could have affected them all. The most significant eruptions that can seriously change the world's climatic patterns come from supervolcanoes like Yellowstone or Mount Toba. Luckily, these erupt very rarely, about every 100,000 years or more. 
Still, climate scientists study volcanic eruptions to understand and explain short periods of cooling in the history of our planet. Every few decades or so, a volcanic eruption lets out a substantial number of particles and gases. Some of them will block enough sunlight to start a brief global cooling period. Nothing like the real volcanic winter, but still felt across the globe. Oh wow, there's a hole in the bottom of the ocean! It seems that the ocean has a leak. But it's not like a leak you would expect, where water is flowing out. It's more like a spring since water is flowing in, not out. This unique leak is something we know as Pythia's oasis. A grad student was the one who accidentally discovered it. He noticed bubbles that were rising to the surface. Normally, bubbles in the ocean tell us there might be some hydrothermal vents, which are hotspots for some pretty cool things. These vents are actually like hot springs on the seafloor, but instead of bubbling with warm water, they release a fluid that has been superheated in the crust of our planet. When seawater seeps into these cracks and travels deep into the crust, it comes into contact with the extremely hot mantle. This heats seawater to very high temperatures, and as it moves back up towards the surface, it carries dissolved gases and minerals. When the hot fluid shoots out of the vents, it mixes with the surrounding seawater and quickly cools down. Just a short distance away from the vent, the temperature can drop to a comfortable 68 degrees Fahrenheit or so. Which is, as it seems, exactly what some creatures like. And there are some real weirdos living down there in the darkness, like ghostly fish, giant red-tipped tube worms, and a unique type of shrimp with eyes on their back. And some of them, like tube worms and bacteria, rely on the chemicals and minerals released by the vents to survive in harsh conditions. But in this case, the bubbling water didn't come from a hydrothermal vent. It was there because of a spring, and that's a bit more concerning. You see, the water in this reservoir needs to stay where it is. If too much of it seeps out, there could be some serious consequences, especially for the surrounding area. You can see this unusual leak along the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a massive fault line off the Pacific Northwest coast. It's a place where two pretty big plates that make up Earth's crust come together and slide along each other. The water from Pythia's oasis kind of acts as a lubricant between these plates. You can think of the fault zone as an air hockey table. When the fluid pressure is high, it's like you've turned the air on. That means the friction between the plates is reduced, which allows the plates to move. But if the fluid pressure is lower, the two plates can lock together, which then leads to the buildup of stress. Not that they'll feel bad. In the context of tectonic plates, stress is some pressure or force that can cause deformation. And if this stress starts to build up, at some point, it's got to go somewhere. When it's too much, it can trigger earthquakes and most likely not small ones. For example, a release of stress in the Cascadia subduction zone could lead to a magnitude 9 earthquake. For comparison, the biggest earthquake we've ever recorded happened in Chile in 1960, and it had a magnitude of 9.5. The damage was enormous. So we hope the water will stay in its reservoir and keep maintaining the delicate balance between the tectonic plates. We've explored only 5% of the ocean. Who knows how many cool things are there at the bottom, waiting to be found? For example, check out these mysterious holes scientists have stumbled upon in the depths of the Atlantic Ocean, near the Azores. They're neatly aligned and are about 4 inches apart, or in some cases, even several feet. They resemble punctures left by a sewing machine. Some think these holes could have a biological origin. For instance, some fish may have made them while walking along the seafloor. Others believe we could be looking at something that's human-made, maybe left by a spiked tire. Of course, such holes are perfect for making up stories about creatures from other planets who allegedly made them. Or maybe even legendary monsters, like that one from Loch Ness. It's definitely hard to explain such symmetry of the holes, but one deep-sea biologist offered a pretty good explanation. He said there could be an animal burrowing beneath the sediment, and from time to time, it could make little chimneys just to get access to clean water circulation in its small burrow. 
I mean, there are sediment piles around the opening of each hole, and they do support the idea that something pushed the soil from below. But there's still no proof these holes are actually connected beneath the surface. And there are also a lot of things hidden at the bottom of the oceans and seas that ancient civilizations left us. For instance, archaeologists made a really cool discovery off the southern coast of Croatia. A road hidden under layers of sea mud that's 7,000 years old. They found the ancient road at the sunken Neolithic site of Solene. The site of Solene was a human-made island in ancient times, and an archaeologist discovered it two years ago. He was studying satellite images of the area around Korčula, one of the beautiful Croatian islands. When he realized there could be something interesting at the bottom of the sea, he dove into the water with his colleague. And under the surface of the Adriatic Sea, which is part of the Mediterranean Sea, at a depth of 13 to 16 feet, they found stone walls that were most likely part of some ancient settlement. The landmass where people built the settlement was separated from the main island by a narrow stretch of land. Luckily, this area is protected from big waves by the surrounding islands, so the site remained relatively well preserved. It's now hidden beneath the surface of the sea and covered in mud. But it's so exciting to imagine how people walked on that road nearly 7,000 years ago, visiting nearby settlements. If you want to see the weirdest creatures, you can always head to the bottom of the sea. Actually, scientists have determined there could be more than 30 potentially new species at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. They've collected them using their remote-controlled vehicle. That's a big step because until recently, they could only study such creatures through photographs. I'm talking about segmented worms, different types of coral, some invertebrates similar to centipedes, and many others. But there are also many old freaky creatures that we already know about that look like they came from sci-fi movies. Red octopus, blobfish, okay this one kinda looks normal until you raise it to the surface, the goblin shark, Sloan's viperfish, zombie worms, ugh, yeah I hear ya, let's move on. The seafloor hides things from space too. There are traces of rare forms of plutonium and iron at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And what's awesome is that all this has come from space. These radioactive materials probably formed during some kind of cataclysmic event in space and eventually made their way out to our beautiful home planet. And this extraterrestrial debris most likely appeared on Earth within the past 10 million years. After it fell to the Pacific Ocean and settled at a depth of almost a mile, it became part of all those layers of rock down there. Plutonium is especially exciting for scientists. I mean, only tiny amounts of it have been found. Hundreds of atoms, maybe. But it's still remarkable because these atoms are created by exploding stars. Things like this can help us better understand how the universe produces elements heavier than iron, like plutonium, gold, uranium, and platinum. We're still not sure about the origins of these elements. For a long time, scientists believed that supernovae, which is when a star comes to its end in a fabulous explosion, were responsible for creating these heavy elements. But it seems it's not just that. Some other cosmic events, such as the collision of neutron stars, which are super dense collapsed stars, or some rare types of supernovae, could also be involved. Whoa, let me get my popcorn! In 2018, the most powerful underwater earthquake occurred between East Africa and Madagascar. There was a deep rift between the Earth's crust and the mantle. Hundreds of thousands of tons of magma came out on the surface of the ocean floor. After that, a huge underwater volcano with a height of 2,700 feet was formed near the coast of Madagascar. This is almost twice the height of the Empire State Building. And all this is hidden under the water. French scientists studied this place since it had regular seismic activity. When the geologists went on an expedition to the coast of Madagascar, they discovered this giant underwater rock, which was not here until recently. With the help of geological equipment, they discovered the earthquake happened deeper than usual, below the Earth's crust. Geologists created a special observatory to monitor the situation at this site in real time. Between February and May 2019, 
they recorded about 17,000 seismic activities below the ocean floor. Scientists had never recorded such deep earthquakes. This suggests that there are reservoirs and drainage systems inside our planet through which magma flows. It's like the veins and vessels of a living organism. The volume of lava the volcano spews at this place can be compared with the volcanic eruptions in the hottest spots of Earth. Perhaps this is one of the most catastrophic, but at the same time, beautiful events in nature over the past few years. To understand what can be beautiful about this, let's first figure out what an underwater volcano is and how it works. Inside our planet, there are incandescent liquid metals and molten rocks containing almost all the chemical elements from the periodic table. All this hot substance is called magma, which constantly flows in the planet's bowels. Anyway, magma is lighter than the surrounding Earth's crust, so it always tries to break out upwards. Fortunately, the surface of our planet is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes it happens, and here's why. The Earth's crust consists of many solid parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other because of movement. Imagine a massive picture of puzzles. Each detail of this puzzle is a tectonic plate, and they all are constantly moving. Sometimes one puzzle gets unhooked from another. When this happens, magma immediately spills out of the resulting gap. And these places of faults with flowing magma we call volcanoes. When such a volcano erupts, a new geology begins. A splash of magma shakes the ocean floor. Lava and ash erupt from the inside of our planet. It causes a release of destructive energy of incredible power. But thanks to the water, such a catastrophe can go unnoticed. More than 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. But inside the water, there's a total mess. Lava heats the water and destroys the seabed. The ocean in this area boils, and large air bubbles rise up. But the enormous pressure of hundreds of millions of gallons of water suppresses the volcano's destructive power. Molten rocks of the Earth's crust are pressed against the seabed. The ocean blocks the consequences of the disaster. But sometimes, the eruption gets to the surface. Such a case occurred in 2012. Vast pieces of pumice the size of a van began to float up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. There were hundreds, even thousands of them. It was more like a group of unknown islands. Volcanic rocks scattered in the ocean over an area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists used deep-sea sonar apparatus on the remote control to determine the full scale of the disaster. They studied the seabed for a long time and found 14 craters that released lava. The researchers saw that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and scattered throughout the ocean. The rest was scattered along the bottom. It destroyed all marine life in the area. However, after the eruption of volcanoes, life is reborn like a phoenix from the ashes. Volcanic ash, lava, and soil around the volcano contain many useful elements and minerals. They nourish the soil and promote the development of microorganisms not only on land but also in water. That's why there's so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form natural islands. This is a long process, resulting from which a large piece of land comes out of the water. When magma goes out, the water immediately presses it to the seabed. The eruption can go on for a long time. The released magma raises the level of the seabed. After another hundred, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows lay a new layer on the surface of the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano has been growing. It's slowly rising up because of constant eruptions. Some volcanoes may go out forever, and some continue to erupt. And then, one day, the level of volcanic rock reaches the surface in the form of a huge island. After many more years, the volcano may go out and then life appears on the formed island. The destroyed seabed area is filled with animals, trees, flowers, and plants. These volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all continents. 
Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth was born. There are hundreds of islands around the world that have appeared because of eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, and Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people. They build villages and small towns there. The ground on such islands is fertile. Fruits and vegetables grow there. The water is filled with fish. Such places may seem like paradise, but at the same time, it's dangerous to live there because the volcano may wake up. One of the most famous eruptions occurred on the island of Ogashima, south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful city right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, the eruption began. No one expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose and flew away from the island. And then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from beneath the underground depths. Thick smoke escaped from the top of the green volcano. The mountain threw dirt, large rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People managed to evacuate. And then there was a long recovery. Locals rebuilt the houses and brought the city back. Almost 250 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano has never woken up. Despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue to live there. The population is growing since this place resembles paradise, and no one wants to leave it. There are thermal springs, dense jungles with rich soil, and many fish. Meteorological and seismological services constantly monitor the volcano's activity. Movements and fractures of tectonic plates create another natural disaster, destructive tsunamis. Unlike volcanoes, huge waves are formed when seismic activity causes the crust to move vertically, up or down. When this happens, water pressure shifts on the ocean floor, which releases energy. This energy pushes the water and creates a tsunami. By the same principle, you form a small wave when you throw a stone into the water. First, a small tsunami appears. Then it picks up speed and increases in size. Its height can reach the level of a five-story building. It's heading for the coast and accelerating to 500 miles per hour. This is almost twice as fast as a Formula One race car. Millions of gallons of water, weighing thousands of tons, are getting closer. And now, the wave reaches the shore and demolishes everything in its path. Houses, trees, cars, nothing can withstand the destructive force of nature. Such tsunamis are a frequent occurrence on the coast of Japan. People have built massive shields near the land to stop the waves before they hit the shore. Still, in spite of all preparedness, somehow, nature always prevails. Back in 2018, the biggest active underwater eruption ever happened. At least, the one that we could officially record. Scientists followed earthquakes that struck the area in the western Indian Ocean off Madagascar. Between 2018 and 2021, over 11,000 earthquakes struck a small island called Mayan between Madagascar and Mozambique. The strongest one had a magnitude of 5.9. Until then, this area had been pretty peaceful. There had only been two earthquakes recorded over 50 years. Along with regular earthquakes, there were also some unusual seismic humps, like earthquakes at pretty low frequencies, forming deep underground. People couldn't feel those humps at the surface, but researchers around the world discovered them and realized they were related to volcanic activity no one actually noticed coming. Something strange happened. That underwater eruption created a giant skyscraper-sized volcano. This new underwater volcano turned out to be around one and a half times the height of One World Trade Center in New York, and almost 10 times bigger than the Statue of Liberty. The area where it appeared had been explored in 2014, but it was almost flat, peaceful, and empty back then. Now there is an actual volcano nearly 8,500 feet below sea level. The volcano gets its magma from a super-profound reservoir located nearly 34 miles underground. It's the deepest reservoir of volcanic magma that we know about. The Earth has layers, and the middle one is kind of chunky. 
It's very much like peanut caramel filling many chocolates have. Research shows there are probably hunks of oceanic crust deep inside the Earth's liquid mantle. They're stuck there, creating large lumps in something that was supposed to be a smooth layer. Our planet has a rigid outer layer. It includes a hot upper mantle and cracked crust. The hot mantle moves and churns all the time, making the crust at the surface move too. This way, the oceanic crust dives into the depths and makes huge magma plumes go up toward the planet's surface. Scientists even found an ancient piece of the Pacific Ocean hundreds of miles underneath China. Those are the old remains of the Pacific seabed from long ago, and they were pulled downward below Earth's surface into the mantle transition zone. This rocky slab that used to be at the bottom of the ocean is made of the crust and some solid parts of the upper mantle. Most of the volcanic activity on our planet happens where we don't even see it, under the surface of the ocean. About 70% of all volcanic activity happens in the oceans, and mostly in the area of the South Pacific, with over 1,100 volcanoes squeezed into that area. Coastal cliffs, mountain changes, soils, and sediments that line valleys – these are only a small portion of the rocks on our planet. Oceans hide so much more deep down below the Earth's surface. In between the Earth's surface and its core is the mantle. It's a warm, thick layer of rock that moves and flows constantly. Some hundreds of miles below, there's a place where diamonds grow. As they form, they go through high temperatures and pressure, after which they eventually freeze. That way, when they arrive at the surface, scientists can explore their structure, find out how they formed, and understand better what's going on in the depths of our planet. Thanks to diamonds, they realize the mantle was very wet, and it possibly contained much more water than all the oceans on Earth. Our planet is eating up its own oceans. As its tectonic plates move, dive, and go beneath one another, they drag huge amounts of water into the Earth's interior. The water beneath the surface of our planet can help with developing magma and lubricate faults, which actually makes earthquakes more likely to happen. Water is actually stored in the minerals. It gets incorporated into the planet's crust when new oceanic plates form. They go through the process of bending and cracking as they grind under other plates, and huge amounts of water then go deep into the crust and mantle. Scientists research an area that's 18 miles under the surface. They realize these zones pull 3 billion teragrams, which is more than 2 billion pounds. Any ocean is like a whole new world. There are incredible sceneries below the surface. Magnificent waterfalls, lakes, and rivers. There are thick layers of salt beneath the seafloor, and rivers and lakes form because seawater goes through those layers and dissolves them, creating something that resembles pools. The dissolved salt makes the surrounding water denser. That water then settles there, which eventually forms underwater lakes or rivers. But there are also mountain chains, trenches, canyons. There's a canyon in the Bering Sea with more than 8,500 feet of vertical relief. This makes the Grand Canyon look way smaller than it is, since the underwater canyon is nearly 2,500 feet deeper. Deep parts of the ocean are really cold. The temperature of the water can be about 40 degrees, but at the bottom, water can get boiling hot. There are hydrothermal vents in the seafloor. Those are the hot springs located at the edges of tectonic plates. The water they release can reach a temperature of up to 750 degrees Fahrenheit. But the pressure at such depths is very intense. So intense, no human being can handle it. Still, it's the pressure that keeps the water from boiling. Ocean depth is on average 2.3 miles. Light waves can still enter at 3,280 feet, even though it's in a very small amount. So all the mysteries hidden below that point remain in total darkness. The actual illuminated part of the ocean goes until 600 feet. Even though the sun gives us light, most of our planet is dark all the time. It's all because of the oceans, covering over 70% of our planet. The loudest sound that came from an ocean, and of the loudest sounds ever recorded, came from an ice quake. It was so loud, researchers picked it up by sensors more than 3,000 miles away. There was a seismic activity that made frozen ground break down. 
The Antarctic ice sheet is bigger than the continental part of the United States and Mexico together. A big iceberg from Antarctica holds over 20 billion gallons of water, which could make a five-year water supply for a million people. Humans can generally drink sea ice, although we can't drink seawater. As time goes by and the ice ages, the brine trap between ice crystals drains out. That way, ice becomes fresh enough to consume it. If all the ice sheets and glaciers we have on the Earth melted at the same time, the sea level would rise another 260 feet, which is just a little shorter than the Statue of Liberty, the height of a 26-story building. Clams live long enough to tell us more about ocean's past. Ancient mollusks could live for more than 500 years. To learn more about a tree, you can use its rings to see how old it is. To learn how old a mollusk is, you can examine its rings within the shell and tell. This is also how scientists get information about the ocean, climate, and whatsoever. Clams can help take a look at what happened about a thousand years ago. The Earth doesn't have four, but five oceans now. The new one, called the Southern Ocean, was officially recognized only a few months ago. It borders the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Oceans, so scientists couldn't agree if it's really a new ocean or just part of the colder regions of these three. We don't only divide oceans on maps. Each has different conditions for unique marine species. For example, the Southern Ocean has leopard seals, orcas, minke whales, emperor penguins, and other animals that live in cold, icy seas. It's also home to krill, small creatures that look like shrimp and are food for many bigger animals that live there. Life on our planet started about 3.5 billion years ago. I wasn't around then. It's still a mystery how and when exactly, but some theories say life could have first emerged in the depths of the ocean. A few years ago, scientists found microscopic tubes and filaments within rocks formed about 4 billion years ago. These rocks are fragments of ancient oceanic crust. Also, these tiny tubes and filaments are similar to microbes that can still be found on hydrothermal vents in deep parts of the ocean. The idea is these living cells found conditions to stay alive in tiny rocky pores inside the chimneys of those vents and started the amazing adventure of the evolution of life on our planet. How would you describe the shape of the planet we live on? It's definitely round, but it's not a perfect sphere. Because of the force of Earth's rotation, it's slightly flat on the North and South Pole. But there's more to it. The planet's rotation causes its sides to bulge outwards. The best term to describe our home planet is ellipsoid. Earth is nothing more than an oversized lumpy potato. These are the words of Atraji Ghosh, a solid Earth geophysicist from Bangalore. She and her team have been studying something called the Indian Ocean Gravity Hole. Sounds like the scenario for a science fiction movie, but it's very much real. We think of gravity as something consistent. If you drop a pen from your hand in Los Angeles and in Perth, they're going to fall to the floor at the same time. Well, this is not completely true. Gravity is connected with the mass of a celestial body. Astronauts on the surface of our moon don't walk, but move in hops. That's because Earth weighs 81 times more than the moon. Less mass means less gravity. Earth is more massive, so it has a stronger gravitational pull. But there's a catch. All this mass isn't distributed evenly across the planet. As a result, gravity varies as well. NASA has been mapping Earth's gravity field since 2002 using twin GRACE satellites. The maps they produced show where gravity is stronger and where it's weaker. Mountain ranges such as the Himalayas contain a lot of mass. This means they generate a stronger gravity field. The opposite happens in ocean trenches. The deepest of them is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. You could almost stack two Mount Kilimanjaros inside it. The low concentration of Earth's mass below it means that the gravity field here is weaker. Places on the globe where huge chunks of mass are missing are called geoid lows. A geoid is an imaginary surface that follows the outline of sea levels around our planet. Imagine the Earth without any land. That shouldn't be too hard since the nickname of our home is Blue Planet. 
Now draw a curvy line along the surface of the oceans, and you get a geoid. In reality, the line stretches across oceans, as well as land masses. Scientists use this imaginary line to calculate the depth of tremors or objects that occur underground. When the wavy line goes down, that's a geoid low. The biggest of them sits at the bottom of the Indian Ocean. The first to discover it was a Dutch geophysicist in 1948. He was performing a gravity survey from a ship. The man noticed that sea levels dipped over 320 feet below the global average. The gravity hole got the official name Indian Ocean Geoid Low. It spans well over a million square miles off the southern coast of India. If you went out at sea in the middle of the gravity hole, you wouldn't notice much, just an endless ocean as far as the eye could see. The only way to measure the dip in gravity is through extensive geophysical measurements and calculations. The concept of a gravitational hole existed for nearly two centuries in the scientific community, but researchers could study it in high detail only after satellite measurements became possible in the late 20th century. A team of Indian scientists was determined to explain the anomaly that had been puzzling geologists for decades. They used supercomputers to simulate the seismic activity that formed our planet. A total of 19 simulations revealed how tectonic plates moved across the span of over 140 million years. This was during the Cretaceous period, the time when T. rex roamed the Earth. Nearly a third of the possible scenarios produced a geoid low, similar to the one in the Indian Ocean. The most important factor in these models was the presence of magma plumes. These are places inside the Earth's mantle where lava flows upwards. The mantle sits between the planet's outer core and the thin crust we walk upon. The magma in the mantle plume is hotter than the surrounding rocks. The heat it generates melts and thins the crust. This creates hotspots that are brimming with volcanic activity. Yellowstone National Park and the Hawaiian Islands sit atop such hotspots. The Indian team of scientists linked the presence of magma plumes to the formation of the geoid low. Their source was an ancient ocean that disappeared tens of millions of years ago. It was located where the Himalayan mountain range sits today. Evidence of this lie in the marine rocks researchers found on the world's tallest mountains. The oceans ceased to exist when India's landmass separated from the supercontinent called Gondwana. It drifted north and merged with the rest of the Asian continent. At the time, the Eurasian supercontinent was called Laurasia. The Indian tectonic plate went down inside the mantle. It ended up under the African continent. This landmass contained a lot of crystallized material, which was quite dense. When the sinking plate of the former ocean reached it, plumes of magma spilled out. As a result, low-density materials ended up closer to Earth's surface. Density is used to calculate mass, and if you remember our lesson in physics from the beginning of the video, less mass translates into a weaker gravity field. Scientists believe this is how the geoid low in the Indian Ocean formed some 20 million years ago. At this point in prehistory, the Earth looked a lot like it does today. There were vast grasslands, and whales swam in the seas. Geophysicists who created the computer model cannot tell for sure what will happen in the future. Ghosh thinks it's possible that the gravity hole in the Indian Ocean will remain in place for a long time. But plate movements can also cause the anomaly to fully disappear in the coming eons. Earth's tectonic plates are constantly shifting. They define the shape of our continents and oceans. Experts study plate movements to get a picture of how our world looked millions of years ago. However, telling Earth's geologic future is much more complex. The gravity hole in the Indian Ocean is the biggest, but it's not the only one in the world. Other areas with low gravity include the island of Cuba and the Bahamas. On the opposite side of the spectrum are the Philippines. Here, gravity is stronger than normal, but the poles are the places with the strongest pull to them. They are the closest to the center of the Earth. If you stand directly on the North or the South Pole, you are 3,950 miles from the planet's core. At sea level on the equator, this distance increases by more than 13 miles. 
Earth's gravitational field also has an effect on your weight. At the equator, you weigh 1% less than you do on the poles. The South Pole is maybe more suitable for this experiment because there is actually ground there. But gravity is the strongest at the North Pole in the middle of the Arctic Ocean. This is where scientists in 2013 recorded the highest gravitational acceleration on the planet. This is the rate a falling object speeds up in freefall. The acceleration depends on the strength of gravity. When a team of researchers from a university in Perth set out to map these gravity changes, they discovered something interesting. Gravitational acceleration was the highest at the surface of the Arctic Ocean. This is something they expect to find, but the location of the lowest acceleration point amazed them. It wasn't on the equator as they assumed. The spot lay more than 600 miles south of it at Mount Huascaru in Peru. Scientists believe that the mountain's height had an effect on the phenomenon. This peak in the Andes is the highest point in the South American country. Hypothetically speaking, if a human falls from a height of 330 feet here, they will reach the ground 16 milliseconds later than if they performed the same stunt in the Arctic. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds, some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes. Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu, or some other colossal deep-water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation. Iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean.
The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over seven minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 Hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls it at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, 
don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. Ever wonder why, despite all our advancements in technology and science, there's a vast expanse of our own planet that we barely know about? Believe it or not, over 80% of our oceans remain uncharted territory. It's as if we've got this massive aquatic playground in our backyard and we've barely scratched the surface. Also, did you know that only about 7% of our oceans have a special tag called Marine Protected Areas, or MPAs? How come this colossal body of water that envelops most of our planet is also among the most vulnerable and misunderstood spaces in the universe? Pressure has a lot to do with it. Our deep ocean is a beast of a place with no visibility, freezing temperatures, and pressure that's so intense that in certain areas it would make you feel like you're having the weight of 50 jumbo jets on your body. No wonder we're having an easier time sending people into space than to the bottom of the ocean. The deeper you go into the waters, the more pressure piles up. But let's not forget we have tech on our side, right? Scientists now use these cool satellite technologies that track the color of the ocean to check how much phytoplankton is there, for example. Why is this important, you might ask? Because these little plant-like critters are actually pretty major players in our big blue oceans. In the grand scheme of things in the aquatic world, phytoplankton is like the bedrock of the ocean food chain. It gives life to almost everything, from the tiny zooplankton, which are animal-like microorganisms, to those colossal, magnificent whales. When these technologies first came around, satellites could get clear images of the ocean faster than a ship could take the same number of measurements in 10 years. But it's not all about looking at the ocean from space. Sometimes you gotta dive in there and see it for yourself. Thankfully, we've come a long way in ocean exploration tech too. We've got things like floats and drifters that ride the ocean currents while collecting data and a whole fleet of underwater vehicles, some of which are manned, some remote controlled, and some even autonomous. Remember James Cameron, the guy who made the movie Titanic? He's super into exploring the ocean, and in 2012, he set a record by going down to the Mariana Trench in a vertical torpedo sub. He thinks there's nothing like being in the ocean and experiencing it firsthand. Other companies use a mix of technologies for their ocean explorations. It led them to discover amazing stuff like a deep sea coral reef near Morocco, the only one still growing in the Mediterranean Sea. They've also discovered new species and documented ones previously thought to live only in the Atlantic. These efforts have convinced the local authorities to declare some places as marine parks. As with most scientific areas, the road isn't without its bumps. These expeditions can cost quite a lot, and the lack of detailed maps and data only adds to the challenge. We can't always rely on bathymetric information, meaning the study of the ocean floor, because it's often not available. And that's the tricky part. We need to explore more to know more, but getting the funds for these kinds of projects can be tough when there are so many unknown variables. One particular company's explorations have helped protect nearly 4 million square miles of oceans so far. The data they collect during their expeditions is invaluable. It's used to identify new species, locate vulnerable habitats, and even show where threatened species are being overlooked. Their work helps dismiss excuses from local authorities who claim they lack the necessary information to establish more MPAs. The same company supports a goal known as 30 by 30, aiming to protect 30% of our oceans by 2030. It's a big target and there's a long road ahead, but ongoing ocean exploration can provide the proof needed to keep more of our oceans safe. 
We also need to set aside areas for protection and research, even when we don't have all the facts just yet. On that note, some cool scientists have recently stumbled upon a gigantic and mysterious world beneath the Pacific Northwest Coast's ocean floor. The best part is, this massive realm of life is pretty much cut off from the rest of the world above, making it like a secret underground club that only the best microbiologists have access to. Picture an active city. Except the city is microscopic cracks in the basalt rocks of our oceanic crust, and its residents are microbes. These tiny creatures aren't like you and me. They don't rely on sunlight or the organic products of land and water ecosystems for sustenance. Instead, they thrive on chemical reactions with rocks and seawater. Scientists call this type of life chemosynthetic, which sounds complicated, but it basically means life sustained by chemical reactions. While this sort of life has been found deep in mines and around seafloor hydrothermal vents, the scale at which these creatures are found under the oceanic crust is unprecedented. It might even be the most extensive ecosystem on Earth. A geomicrobiologist from Denmark was part of the team that made this discovery. He claimed that over 50% of our planet's surface is oceanic crust, which is an average of 4 miles thick. Imagine the size of this chemosynthetic party happening down there. This discovery didn't happen overnight. Since the 90s, scientists have found weird tiny holes in the basalt rocks that make up much of Earth's outer crust. They seem like they might have been made by bacteria. But hey, there was supposed to be no life there. I mean, imagine trying to survive in a place that's hot, deep, dark, dense, and mostly devoid of the organic compounds we need for life. Yet, here they are. In the following years, more pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Scientists found that the oceanic crusts had different conditions at the centers and edges. At the centers, rocks are jam-packed with energy-rich compounds that support these tiny life forms. But by the time they reach the edges, these chemicals are all gone. Fast forward to now, and it's time to put the puzzle together. A microbial ecologist from the University of North Carolina worked on this research and says we now have solid evidence of microbial life in the cracks and crevices of deep ocean basalt. The next question scientists asked was, how far does this life extend? Researchers collected samples of crust from a plate roughly 120 miles off of Washington's coast, drilling deep beneath the ocean's surface. What they found down there was remarkable. The life down there runs on a unique fuel, hydrogen. Yep, in the absence of sunlight, hydrogen provides the energy for all their biological processes. These microbes use hydrogen to transform carbon dioxide into organic matter. This matter and other byproducts, like methane, then fuel other organisms, creating a network of life. Of course, the life down there isn't as complex as the one we know up here. Scientists doubt there will be any multicellular life under the ocean because it's too hot and energy poor. But hey, who knows? This universe under our oceans still has a lot to reveal. This whole thing is significant for many reasons. First, it confirms that life can exist in places without oxygen, which changes our perspective on where we can find life. This makes us wonder if life could exist under similar conditions on other planets, where surface conditions might be too harsh. The implications on Earth are also profound. If a large portion of life exists in the oceanic crust, then our understanding of life on our own planet could be completely changed. This exciting discovery stretches our understanding of life and prompts us to keep exploring the mysterious depths of our oceans, pushing the limits of our understanding. NASA is also in on the whole deep sea exploration project. Why? Shouldn't they be preoccupied with outer space? Because they're hoping to find hints about what the oceans on other planets might look like. NASA specialists are really hopeful that by unearthing underwater secrets, we can solve some of the big questions about space. Plus, they're testing some nifty equipment for future journeys across our solar system. Hey, don't freak out. Those red waters you see aren't blood oceans. It's just a natural occurrence called the red tide. 
Red tides often happen in Florida, especially in the West Florida Shelf, and they can stick around for weeks or even months. They're basically caused by an increase in algae levels, hence the color. Those algae produce toxins that can be harmful to marine life. They can also be bad news for us humans, causing symptoms like upset stomach and uh, urgent bathroom trips, if you're picking up what I'm putting down. Volcanoes are super scary, but there's nothing scarier than getting taken out by a pyroclastic flow. These fiery flows move crazy fast and reach insane temperatures, like hotter than your oven on a pizza night. They're like a fireworks show of volcanic eruptions filled with ash, lava, and hot gas, speeding down mountains at 50 miles per hour. Some researchers claim they might even hit speeds of 450 miles per hour, almost as fast as a passenger jet. If you're unlucky enough to be in the path of a flow, you're in big trouble. The heat alone can turn you into a human barbecue, even if you try to hide in a building. The air around the flow can reach temperatures high enough to fry your insides, burn your clothes off, and leave metal melted into your skin, which almost sounds like a Marvel origin story. However, a lot of people have met their end because of these flows. But there is one crazy story about a guy named Luger Silbaris, still sounding like an origin story. So on the 7th of May, 1902, there was a major eruption on the island of Martinique. The night before, Silbaris had gotten into trouble and ended up in jail. Maybe this is a villain origin story. He'd been locked in a sturdy cell facing away from the volcano. The next morning, Mount Pella unexpectedly erupted, destroying St. Pierre within minutes. The flows wiped out around 30,000 people, but Silbaris survived in his cell and became known as the guy who lived through doomsday. The rescue team found him four days later. By the way, the cell still stands today. I hope somebody tested him for superpowers. Back on August 21st, 1986, a guy stumbled upon some animals showing no signs of life on his way to Neos village in Cameroon. To his shock, he later found out that everyone in the village had mysteriously passed away. The same thing happened at Lake Manown in 1984. Turns out, those tragic incidents were caused by something called limnic eruptions, which are pretty rare disasters where carbon dioxide suddenly bursts out of lake waters, creating a hazardous gas cloud. These type of eruptions usually happen in lakes with high levels of CO2, which can be caused by things like volcanic gases and high pressure. Any little change in temperature or pressure can set off an eruption. So, experts have started looking into ways to safely release CO2 from lakes, like Manown and Nios, in order to lower the risk of more disasters in the future. In March 2024, a video captured a terrifying moment of a woman disappearing into a sinkhole while browsing through a Chinese department store. Guess she got more than she bargained for. <laughs> Moving on! The scene unfolded as the floor beneath her gave way, sending her plummeting into the abyss. In the midst of the chaos, another customer frantically ran away before returning to check on the woman who had fallen. Their quick thinking and the swift response of emergency crews and firefighters saved the day, resulting in only minor injuries for both women. I'm glad that lady checked on her because I would be gone. An anvil cloud is basically a big cloud made of ice particles that forms at the top of really tall thunderstorms, or those huge cumulonimbus clouds. The flat top shape is caused by the air rising in the storm and spreading out when it hits the stratosphere. That's why it's called an anvil. It looks like the tool metal workers use. Duh. The air from the anvil cloud is cooler than the stratosphere air, which keeps it from going any higher. You can spot anvil clouds from really far away sometimes over 100 miles. Often you might see streaks of snow coming from the edge of the cloud known as Virga. The snow disappears before hitting the ground because of the dry air. If you notice clouds poking through the flat top or bubbling up, it's an overshooting top, a sign of a super strong storm. Anvils are known for producing dangerous lightning. Normally, lightning comes from the bottom of a storm, but anvil clouds can produce really powerful lightning from the top. This lightning can strike out of nowhere, even from up to 30 miles away. 
so keep an eye on those anvil clouds if you see one forming nearby. Lahars are no joke. They're basically fast-moving, super dangerous streams of rock, ash, and water that come down the slopes of volcanoes. It's important for everyone to be aware of them. Scientists, policymakers, and even us regular folks. By understanding how lahars work and their potential impact, we can try to stay safe when volcanoes start acting up. Saving lives during natural disasters is the name of the game. There are two main types of lahars. Debris lahars and mudflow lahars. Debris lahars are full of solid stuff like rocks and ash, while mudflow lahars are more waterlogged and sludgy. Lahars can be triggered by the rapid melting of snow or ice, heavy rain falling on loose volcanic material, or even a crater-like eruption. The volcano's characteristics and presence of water are key factors in how lahars form and move downhill. When lahars come barreling down mountains at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, carrying loads of debris, it's a recipe for disaster. Unless you have a surfboard, but I doubt you'll have a surfboard on a volcano. Just saying. Also, it won't work. Going to the beach for a sunny vacation is the best. There's nothing like basking in the sun, feeling sand between your toes, and hearing waves crash against the shore. But even though it's all relaxing and picture perfect, always keep an eye on the water and never turn your back on the ocean. You may know about rip currents and tides, but have you ever heard of square waves? It's a real thing, and it can be pretty scary. Square waves, also known as cross seas, happen when two swells meet, forming a unique square pattern that looks like a checkerboard. They can be found along coastal areas, and while they are rare, they can create waves up to 10 feet high and make it tough for boats and swimmers to maneuver. If you find yourself in the water with square waves, you might feel like you're fighting against two different currents. The best thing to do is to not go too far out to begin with and get out of the water as soon as the waves become too strong. Square waves are more dangerous for boats and ships, so it's best to stick to the shallow waters and stay safe. Whirlpools and maelstroms are powerful natural forces that have scared sailors for years. They happen when certain weather and current conditions come together just right. Most of them are safe if you stay away, but let's see what they really are and how they form. A whirlpool is basically water that starts spinning when two currents meet or one current hits something solid like a wall. They can be big or small, depending on the speed of the water and waves. Most aren't dangerous, but there are also maelstroms, which are large, forceful, and violent whirlpools caused by ocean tides and narrow straits. Tidal currents in places like Norway's Saltströmmen and Mokstrømmen can create massive whirlpools. Scotland's Korovreken whirlpool is one of the world's largest. Other examples of whirlpools can be found in Japan, Canada, and New Zealand. Are they portals? They're definitely not portals. Researchers have recently looked into ancient underwater volcanic eruptions and how they affected Earth's climate. They studied materials from Bronze Age eruptions to learn more about their scale, dangers, and impact on climate. For example, one eruption about 3,600 years ago in the Aegean Sea caused chaos in Santorini. The study focused on this event to understand its importance. By analyzing volcanic deposits, the researchers gained insights into how future eruptions could affect climate they discovered that sediment waves from shallow underwater eruptions could lead to tsunamis and impact the ocean floor. These findings help us understand how underwater volcanic eruptions relate to the marine environment, which can help us predict climate changes in the future.